In this series, we're going through and looking at the letter written to the Hebrews. We've now reached presentation four. <clears throat> this starts looking at the idea of Jesus as the great high priest. Let's just look back at where we were in the previous presentation. One of the key ideas that was there was the idea of the word rest. But the word and the way it was used doesn't mean an activity. <clears throat> you could describe it that way. The rest that comes when the will of God is brought to completion. Now that implies for you and me a spiritual state that's open to us. To share God's serenity in his purposes and direction. When things are moving forward and brought to completion. <clears throat> the writer makes it quite clear. Rest is part of our inheritance as people of God. But there's no guarantee you will get it. The key, and the writer stresses this, rests in one word, obedience. To be part of God's plan and to experience his rest depends on the extent of our obedience to him. Bringing that together, <clears throat> when we share God's serenity and purpose and direction, that means we enjoy a rest in the biblical sense. It means experiencing the will of God brought to completion. We're part of the purpose and plan of God. We see it coming to completion. The writer stresses that God is at rest. But we are free to choose to share that rest. All comes back to obedience. Following his creation, God's plans are set in motion for the creation, development and destiny of humanity. The rest of God's Sabbath. Not an activity, but God's purposes and direction moving forward and being fulfilled. Now we can choose to share that through obedience. We choose to become part of God's plan for the destiny of humanity and his creation. And we share the concept of rest, the idea of serenity, when the purposes of God, the direction of God, are moving forward in the way he wishes. And it brings a deep sense of security and peace within us. But it comes through obedience when we respond to him. Now in the first three presentations, we looked at the first section of the journey that's in the book of Hebrews. God speaks. So we concluded that at chapter 4 verse 13 in the last presentation. Now we're moving on to the high priesthood of Jesus. And you'll note this is quite a long stretch and the writer moves around and comes away from it from time to time. So let's now look forward and go into chapter 4 and verse 14. Jesus, the great high priest. The writer writes, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to feel sympathy for our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. <clears throat> now in this section, several key elements are brought together. I'm going to pick out some of the key points. Jesus pictured here as the great high priest. Touched upon previously, it's going to be developed in the next few chapters. But Jesus is pictured here as having ascended. He's restored to his rightful place. But it refers to Jesus, the Son of God. His divinity is emphasized. God entered the human arena 
in the life of Jesus, choosing to limit himself within a human being. Jesus was totally human in every way. He faced all the temptations, all the pressures that we face. The big difference was, he didn't go wrong. Now because of his experience, he's got a complete understanding of what we're going through. And because he's got that understanding of what we're going through, he can help us. He went through just the same, but he never rebelled against God. He never turned away from God's purposes. He's there to help us, to move us forward. He's there for us in our time of need. Now this section gives us tremendous confidence and reassurance. And it's been used positively that way down through the centuries. Now against that back cross, let's move on to chapter 5. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters or related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself, he himself is subject to weakness. That is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes his honour on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. He's picturing here the Jewish priesthood system the high priesthood system specifically. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest. It's not self-selection, but God said to him, You are my son, today I become your father. A relationship. He said in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, as always, he's picking up references to the Old Testament. We'll have to look further at what we mean by in the <coughs> order of Melchizedek and his differences from the priesthood initiated by Aaron. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, that is God, he learned obedience from what he suffered and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek, referring back to Psalm 110 verse 4. A lot of deep thoughts in this section. This is the author's real introduction to Jesus the great high priest. But he describes what a high priest does. Very clear description. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters relating to God to offer sacrifices and gifts and sacrifices for sins. Now that's the Jewish high priesthood and that's a very clear description that fits all the evidence as to the whole concept of high priesthood. Jesus is described as the great high priest. Selected, not self-appointed. Not some human upstart that decides he's going to go down this line. Wants the power and privilege, as you might see it. Selected. But the high priest was an ordinary human being. He represented the people. And he was drawn from among the people. So he's acting on behalf of others. Jesus is a representative humanity 
in drawing us and opening the door so that we can come to God. Parallel to the high priests of the Jewish system, representing the people, giving them access to God as their Lord and King. The Jewish high priests, gifts and sacrifices. You only have to look at the book of Leviticus to look at the meticulous detail of the whole sacrificial system. Jesus fits into that pattern. But he goes beyond it because he goes into the pattern of Melchizedek. Let's go back to the full text. Just drawing out a key point. Every high priest, that section, finishes with Aaron. That's the Jewish priesthood system. Aaron was the first high priest, the brother of Moses. Now the second part looks at Jesus. But this time it finishes well Melchizedek. The strange figure from the Old Testament. We'll look at him further in presentations later on. Somehow Jesus as the great high priest is following a model that goes beyond the priesthood of Aaron and his descendants. And fits a pattern that can be seen in a man called Melchizedek. Now you can't tell from the English, but in that second part, all the verbs there speak of something specific action. It's not kind of general and vague. And it describes the acts and events through which Jesus fulfilled his high priesthood. Sent by God, appointed by God, in the model of Melchizedek. Offering up prayers, that's specific. He was hard, specific. He learned obedience, specific. Through what he suffered, specific. Became the source of eternal salvation, specific. All the verbs. So we're hearing, seeing here the specific events of the life of Jesus. This is not something just vague and general or a general principle. Let's look at this last part. I don't know whether you spotted this and I find it utterly amazing. <clears throat> in some ways there's almost a picture of the Garden of Gethsemane here Jesus pled with God in the Garden of Gethsemane that he wouldn't have to go through death by torture public humiliation on a Roman cross no one wanted in their right mind would ever want to go through that suffering he was heard. You see, so often we think that God hears us when he solves our problems, takes away the situation that's causing the difficulty for us, helps us to avoid something that we don't want to go through. Jesus prayed, fervent cries and tears, only God could save him from death. And he was heard. But he was heard and he went through a flogging and the torture, public humiliation on a Roman cross. Now that just blows the mind. It lifts the whole area of our prayers to a different level. God sees the wider picture. God knows what will bring greater, greatest benefit. And it isn't always that he just solves our problems in some neat way. 
You see, Jesus submitted to becoming a human being. God entered the arena in the life of a human being, Jesus. And he limited himself and worked within that framework, doing what God wanted him to do. And he followed what God wanted him to do. Even in his suffering, and there are perhaps overtones in this section of the agony he went through in Gethsemane when he knew what he was facing that night and the next day. Being made perfect, we find that difficult to get our head round. It says once made perfect, being made perfect, it's actually closer to in the original, having been perfected. How could Jesus, who was perfect, be perfected? The trouble is the word perfected is a very misleading word. Jesus was without defect in the previous section. The writer stresses that. But the word perfected isn't anything to do with moral perfection. The word means made complete, brought to maturity, made fit for purpose. Jesus, by willingly going to the cross, knowing with his eyes open what faced him, he was made complete. He fulfilled totally what God wanted him to do as the saviour of the world. He came to rescue humanity. So if you like, he was perfected in his vocation. It all came to fruition. It was brought to completion, to maturity. That's the idea that's captured in the original word that's used. The picture here that the author is presenting is Jesus, a great high priest, he represents you and me before God. And he liberates, because he was also the sacrifice, he liberates you and me by being the great high priest. Following the model of this strange man Melchizedek, which goes beyond the model of Aaron. Now at this point, the author breaks away from the theme of Jesus, the great high priest. He seems to sense in his hearers a resistance. So he moves to issues related to spiritual inertia or spiritual lethargy. There seems to be a kind of spiritual resistance in the people to whom he is writing. So he breaks away from this high, this theme and we're going to touch into this breakaway in this presentation and complete it in the next one. But then he returns to develop the great high priest idea in greater depth. Now if you like, it's a challenge to you and me to want to move on. Oh, the danger is we rest secure with our religious systems, the way we run our churches, do our things. The Western Church is particularly guilty of that today. Spiritual inertia, spiritual lethargy. There's a challenge here. Do you want to move on? Do you want more? Do you want to make a grip in greater depth? Do you want something much more exciting? That's the challenge. And the challenge is for you and to you and me as individuals, but perhaps even more so, is a challenge to the people of God across the institutional churches in the West. We've made ourselves into a cozy system. We're running a cozy religious system. The challenge is, come on, let's move on. And let's move on in radical new ways that breaks new ground. It's time to move on, is what the author is saying. So let's go with the author, picking it up at verse 11 of chapter 5. And just a few verses here, the challenge starts. 
We have much to say about this, <clears throat> but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. You just want to stay within your cosy religious system. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, same word, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites, better translation baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. Now this section is a real challenge to the people of God in the West today. We've much to say about this. Now he's speaking about the high priesthood of Jesus. He wants to go forward, but he senses the resistance. You no longer try to understand. And it talks about the elementary truths of God's Word. That's nothing to do with the Bible. The word translated word is the wrong word for that. The word there carries the idea of the entire principles and meaning, the communication of what God has done for us in Jesus. Jesus is described as the Word of God. That captures it fully. God shows himself completely in communication in Jesus. But there's a deliberate unwillingness to move on. Oh, how often we want our cosy systems because going beyond them is uncomfortable. Now, there's nothing specific about being a teacher or a teaching system here. Teaching is not was not seen then as we see it today. It's a common phrase, phraseology in the language and culture of the time. That when people knew what they were talking about, they would refer to, oh, you could teach others now. That's all it means. But they hadn't arrived to that. They weren't prepared to go into depth. Therefore, they were not fit to be able to help others. The beginning of God's words. Nothing to do with the Bible. It's all that God has shown us in Jesus. That's the ultimate revelation. Jesus shows us what God really is like. That's pretty brutal. Don't think you probably like that being said of you. You no longer try to understand. Was it fear? Was it unwillingness? Was it both? The phraseology there suggests it's not just a passive inability to understand, but it's active resistance to understanding. We want to get things worked out and develop a cosy system and then relax. That's not the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus is a way of a life of exciting adventure. It's not a cosy existence. And mature, that captures the meaning well. It's nothing to do with moral perfection. It's nothing to do with being mature simply because you've got older. There are plenty of people that are older who are not mature. And there are younger people who are mature. The word carries the idea of completeness. Fit for purpose. Completely fit for purpose. Spiritual maturity. That's what the author is driving them towards. I want to move you forward to spiritual maturity. Are you willing? Are you willing to come with me? Back to the whole text again. Let's fit out the first part and look at the second part. 
one long sentence. That's the key clause. Let us move on to maturity. Now it could equally be translated, the Greek could be either way, let us be moved on to maturity and perhaps both are true. We've got to be willing to move but God enables us to move. Are we willing to move? Are we willing to grapple with new ideas? Are we willing to be challenged in our walk with Jesus? Are we willing to see it as an adventure? Where everything is uncertain it moves forward? Or are we willing to hang on to our cosy religious systems? There's a challenge here between elementary teachings and maturity. And when we look at the elementary teachings that are listed there, and there are six of them, they may take us a bit by surprise. But you see, when you move from the elementary to maturity, spiritual maturity, not head knowledge, spiritual maturity, we've grown closer to Jesus, to understanding his ways. Then it's moving forward, but it's also moving upward. And he's challenging his hearers. Are you willing to move forward and upward? He's challenging us today. Are you willing to move forward and upward? Are you willing to be challenged to rethink things? To move to greater depths with Jesus. Now let's look at these six things that are listed. What the author calls the foundation teachings. It seems a strange list, but in fact it makes an enormous amount of sense. Now you could organise them in different ways, but one suggested way is in three pairs. But let's look at each one in turn. Repentance. It's repentance from dead works. You see, in our societies today and in all religions, there's a system built up, do this, do the other, don't do this, don't do that, God will be pleased. Self-effort is a way to impress God. Keep the rule book, God will be pleased. Judaism had gone that way in the days of Jesus. But it's in every religion, and in some it dominates totally. We reject that. None of us is good enough to impress God and it's laughable to think that we are. Now the positive side of that is faith toward God. Now the word faith is so misunderstood. It's nothing to do with intellectual belief. The word faith in the original language, both in Hebrew and Greek, carries the idea of action. We respond actively to what God has done for us. So we reject the idea that we can impress God by our self-effort, but we listen to what God is saying to us in Jesus and we respond to it. We commit ourselves to Him and commit ourselves to going His way. Baptisms. Now the, the word in the original is just a transliteration to get the word baptisms today. Various translations talk about ritual washings and that kind of softens it. But probably it refers to baptisms. Now, this may come as a surprise to you, but we're moving forward, moving upwards. There's at least three baptisms mentioned in the Bible. So maybe they need to be clear about what baptism meant in the Christian sense. Laying on of hands. You see it a bit today, but we've lost a lot of this. One of the aspects of it is commissioning for service. People don't choose to serve Jesus in specific roles and tasks. Others choose them, and they're commissioned for the task. Look at what happened with Paul in the church group in Antioch. Probably list group of believers meeting in someone's home. They commissioned him to go and travel his first missionary journey. He didn't decide, I want to be it. He was commissioned and they laid hands on him and sent him out. Resurrection of the dead. Well, we lose this so often. Resurrection means bodily resurrection. 
that after death our bodies are restored in some way. It's a spiritual way, but we can recognize each other. Jesus presents the model in his resurrected body. That's our destiny in our future. But we are responsible human beings for what we have done. And there's a verdict from God and outcomes that arise from that. Cause and effect. And God's judgment is perfect. Now you can see that captures a lot of the central things of the teaching of Jesus. Putting them in as pairs, the first pair relate to our relationship with God and Jesus. No longer are we trying to impress God with self-effort. We respond to what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Come into the kingdom and commit ourselves to his way. We declare it outwardly. That's what baptism means. An outward declaration by a person's decision. And then the commissioning for service is the empowerment so that we can serve and do what God wants us to do. And then the, the last pair relates to life beyond the grave. Wonderful life for the followers of Jesus and resurrected bodies. But we've got to remember there are consequences for our actions here on earth. Now, these are the foundation teachings, the basic teachings, and I'm not going into them in great depth, but I want to look at one simply because it causes problems. The word that's used there, or at least the form of the word, which is just baptism without an ending to it. It's the same word as in English. The word that it used focuses on the act or the event. Let's just look at this very briefly. Because it's caused so much confusion. Now there were Jewish ritualistic practices. They had developed relatively late, but they were there in the time of Jesus. That when someone chose to come into the Jewish faith, one of the things that was done was some sort of ritualistic washing. Now, it may very well be that John the Baptist used that for his baptism and transformed it. The word baptism has got a double meaning. It's an ordinary word in the language. It means being immersed or having something poured over us. The two models are the picture of going right under the water, which is water baptism, or as it were, going under a waterfall where you get totally soaked. That's Holy Spirit baptism. Both models are used in the New Testament again and again. Now John, John the Baptist, introduced baptism for repentance. People came to him and said, we want something better. We realize we've messed up and we want to declare it publicly. John baptized them. And he prepared the ground for Jesus. But he described Jesus the one who would baptize in the Holy Spirit. Baptism for empowerment. That teaching was lost for centuries. But it's come back into focus sharply at the beginning of the 20th century and is now widely taught throughout the churches in the world today. Then we have water baptism. Describes in the Gospels Jesus did it. When people decided they wanted to commit themselves to follow the way of Jesus, they declared it publicly by being immersed in water. Usually the disciples of Jesus actually carried out the act. Now that's what's there for us today. The background is perhaps Jewish ritualistic practices. John developed that. But that's the background. Holy Spirit baptism, water baptism. Now you might be surprised in that there's no mention of infant baptism. You can search your New Testament from end to end, you won't find it. Infant baptism developed several centuries after the days of Jesus. And fundamentally, it's not based on biblical ideas. 
Now, if you go to 1 Corinthians 10, and maybe afterwards you want to follow this through, Paul is writing, and there are strong parallels with what he's saying, with what the writer to the Hebrews is saying in this bit about baptisms. Paul is setting his thought in the same desert experiences under Moses, parallel to the writer to the Hebrews. And Paul refers to two baptisms. His actual description is baptized into Moses in the cloud, baptized into Moses in the sea. The first one, and it's the first one, is Holy Spirit baptism. The second one is water baptism. Empowerment declaration. And if you look at that section, the parallels... Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit baptism, water baptism are very marked. And if you look at the story of the baptism of Jesus by John, you will find that Holy Spirit baptism appears in all the accounts in the Gospels. But this is just foundation teaching. And time prevents us going any further and developing this from a biblical perspective. But we're trying to move on. Let's leave that for the moment. In the moving on, God entered our humanity in the life of Jesus. The writer is seeing Jesus, the great high priest. But he develops later, he is also the sacrifice. In his death in our place on the cross. But the priesthood of Jesus follows the model of Melchizedek. It's gone beyond the model of Aaron, the Jewish priesthood. But the challenge to us that the writer is putting here, and we'll pick it up further in the next presentation, the challenge. Are you prepared? Are you wanting? Are you willing to move forward and move upward? Do you want to grapple with these ideas, even when they're uncomfortable, even when they disturb you, even when they disturb the cosy system of the rituals of your own church denomination? Do you want to grapple with these and see what Jesus is actually saying? That's what the writer is pushing us towards all the time. Let's move forward in the adventure of Jesus. That's the challenge for us today. Now in the next presentation we're going to continue these warnings and challenges as the writer develops them for us.